Okay, so we continue with part three. So I start again repeating from here onwards. So the whole point is to understand uh, what would be the way that uh, we can derive a simple relation between current and voltage. And at least we know that where it has come from, we blindly don't accept it. And having that basic information, this is like a level one model. This is called level one in a spice, which is useful for hand calculations. But uh, it's not enough for simulation because simulation considers all second and third and higher order effects. Therefore, when we design, always we need to verify the design with simulation. So to derive this uh, relation, so we started from basic theory that we learn that eventually we have an MOS capacitor and we have an, a semiconductor as one of the plates of this capacitor. Therefore, it gets first depleted and then it will be inverted. So when it is inverted, it will get mainly carriers from source because electrons are available. When it is depleted, means holes will be repelled. I'm talking about N-channel transistor with a P-type substrate. Whenever we talk about P-channel, we just invert everything. So just invert everything. So then we reach this point that uh, if you want to go with the DC IV characteristics, we need to get a relation for current. But till now, we have dealt with capacitor. And the capacitor holds the charge. So in DC, capacitor doesn't conduct in DC. So we want to get the characteristics between, in fact, which depends on the gate source voltage as the controlling voltage for making charge in the channel, mobile charges. And therefore, channel will be conductive. So when it is conductive, we will have a flow of electron from source to drain for N channel and flow of electron from drain to channel, uh, source for P channel transistors. So we started with uh, considering, okay, how much is the density of mobile charge and how much is the total absolute value of mobile charge? So mobile charges are electrons, therefore, and as we learned, this is just like a capacitor with a value of C ox when the channel is inverted. But instead of VGS, which is the voltage we apply between gate and source, it's a difference between gate and source and threshold voltage. In fact, this is good to know that uh, this definition because it is much used for the design. So it is called gate over drive voltage. So in gate over drive voltage, this is a parameter which is very much useful. In fact, by this parameter, you can understand whether the transistor is in subthreshold, is it in the vicinity of uh, conduction, or whether it is completely channel inverted and we are in super threshold or strong inversion region. So that is called VGS minus P threshold. So this gate over drive is a very important parameter. So when we look at the gate as a capacitor, or the, this structure as a capacitor, so it holds the charge per unit area, which is proportional to the difference of VGS and the threshold. Means that the charge is proportional to, or if I call it Q, density of the Q, is actually equal to. C ox into VGS minus VT. So therefore, gate over drive multiplied by C ox, which is the capacitance per unit area, will give us the amount of charge which is stored in unit area. More often, it is mentioned as we uh, discussed, femtofarad per micrometer square, because dimensions are low. And when dimensions are small, value of capacitor also is low. Therefore, we deal with mainly femtofarad per micrometer square, which is a correct so we use same charge because see we deal with charge and convert this charge into current okay so we want to convert so we consider how much charge we have per unit area that is cox into gate over drive and then if i multiply it by w and v i will get the charge in the cuboid which has the length of v 
V is the speed of carriers, and W is the width of that region. And the, therefore, we got the amount of charge which crosses the cross section of the inversion layer or channel in one second. So therefore, V into W is actually the volume of that cube. Okay. So when we multiply by W, we will get per unit length. So therefore, this is per unit length. We multiply it by V. Therefore, we will get the total charge. And this total charge crosses the cross section of this channel in unit of time, which is second. Therefore, it gives you the current. And this, this was the way we derived the current. But current was a function of potential in the channel. Therefore, it was a function of where we are. But then we know that the current is continuous. Therefore, the current doesn't change throughout the channel. So we use this fact, and then we derive the relation. By just taking integration from both sides, and we know the current is constant, therefore we can take ID out, and therefore we get the famous relation of the transistor in strong inversion and ohmic region. So a strong inversion and ohmic region is this, is presented, represented by this relation. Why? Because in this region, channel is completely inverted from source to drain and because it is completely inverted so density of carriers is good enough and therefore for a long channel device velocity of carriers still has not reached to the saturated velocity so that is the long channel first order or level one approximation for the relation so that's the first part so till now we know that, and this is a very simple approximation, we also assume that the mobility of the carriers doesn't change according to gate source voltage, and also it doesn't change throughout the channel. So now when we have this relation, we want to see what happens. Now we know that see, there are two parameters here, one is VDS and one is VGS. So with VGS we control the amount of charge, and VDS we control the amount of field. In fact, if you ignore this part, if you look at only the first part of this relation, it has two parts. One is VGS minus VT and one is VDS. They are multiplied. What does it show? It tells you like VGS minus VT has a nature or, or gives you a nature like a transconductance. In fact, mu Cox W by L VGS minus VT has a nature of transconductance. You need also is ampere per volt. That means that you have a transconductance multiplied by voltage you have applied. It's like a resistor of which the transconductance changes with gate overdrive. Higher gate overdrive, you have higher transconductance and therefore you have higher current. And that is the meaning of trans resistor. So instead of transconductor, they have called it trans resistor, which is same thing. The other term, of course, is the second order term, which appears because this relation is not a full relation, uh, linear relation. So now, of course, if we increase VGS, therefore, naturally, we have, will have a higher transconductance. So now, what, have, what about VDS? So suppose, OK, I want to, for example, uh, get a particular transconductance. I apply a particular VGS, but then now, what happens if I go all the way from minimum VDS, which is zero, to a maximum value? This maximum value depends on the breakdown of the device. Because the oxide thickness is very low, therefore we cannot apply any arbitrary voltage to these devices. They have a maximum tolerable voltage, which is given by the technology. For example, in 180 nanometer technology, we can apply only 1.8 volt. Now, if we increase the VDS, what will happen for the transistor? So for VGS, nothing happens. Therefore, at the source side, channel is as before. But if you look at the drain side, as we increase the VDS, the thickness of this layer reduces further and further. If VDS crosses a particular value, this inversion layer disappears at the drain side. So what do we mean from that? The meaning of this, this is that, see, if you look, gate source determines if VGS is above VT, means channel is formed at the source side. 
Same thing is valid for the drain. It's a symmetric device. Therefore, if gate voltage minus drain voltage will be less than threshold voltage, so therefore there is no channel, no inversion at the drain side. That means that for a given gate voltage, if you increase drain voltage, you will see that slowly, slowly this inversion region, of course, for void device simulation, there is no other way to see that, you will see that the charge will move or this inversion region H will move from drain to our source. So what will happen for that part of the channel, which is now not just depleted, it's not inverted at all. So what will happen? Whether the current will be blocked, we don't have any current. Actually, it's not like that the current will not flow. Current will flow, but density of carriers now, or then, no, okay, let's look at it in this way. Density of carriers is low or the total value of carriers also is low. Now, if it is low, what does that mean? Means that for current to remain same means that the velocity has to increase and that is the way current can remain constant. At the source side, we have a very high density, Vgs minus Vt determines the amount of density of charge. So, and then with some velocity, carriers move or travel through the tunnel. As they move, density drops, but velocity increases. When they reach to the region, when the channel has stopped, which is called pinch off point, at that particular point, the channel has stopped at that particular point and onwards, you will have a very limited density of carriers, but with the maximum possible speed. And that maximum possible speed is the saturation velocity of carriers. And that's why that particular region is called saturation region. That means that the velocity has saturated. So that's why if you look at these plots on the left, you will see the plots of the first part of this relation. We have not gone to the second part yet. First part, which was strong inversion, means channel completely formed everywhere. And it's an oblique region. It behaves like a resistor, like a resistor. So therefore, if you define the current as a function of VGS, current, as you increase VGS, you notice current increases. So therefore, transconductance of this resistor has increased. And there is a peak value. And after that, as you increase VGS further, current drops, as you can see here. Uh, VGS further, current drops, as you can see here. But practically, what will happen? Practically, what will happen is that as you increase VDS, whenever it crosses a particular value of VGS minus VT, current cannot change anymore can, because velocity has reached to the maximum level at the drain side. Therefore, current gets saturated and that's the meaning of saturation region. So that's why instead of left plots, we have right side plots which are common plots that you observe for the transistor and they are called IDVD characteristics of the transistor. For different values of VGS, you have different plots. As you increase VGS, for a given VGS, you have a higher current. For a given VGS, uh, for a given VGS, as you increase VGS in saturation region, current hardly increases. Of course, because of channel length modulation, and output impedance, as we will see, the current changes, but that amount of change is not substantial. Therefore, it behaves like a current source, because in a current source, you have a current which is almost independent of voltage across current source. And because it behaves like a current source, we can use it as a uh, device with a very high output impedance. But this is not the only use. Of course, it can be used as an amplifying comp uh, device. But how much is this maximum current? This maximum current happens almost first order approximation when gauge drain voltage means VGD is equal to is equal to VT, VTH, exactly. So therefore, that's why all these points are shown by VGS minus VT. So VGS1 minus VT, VGS2 minus VT, these are the, those pinch off points. So when it reaches to these points, then current gets almost, you know, saturated. And that, therefore, what 
to derive it, therefore you need to de replace VDS by VGS minus VT in this relation. And when you replace VDS by VGS minus VT, naturally you will get VGS minus VT squared minus 1 upon 2 VGS minus VT squared. Therefore, the relation gets uh, simplified to VGS minus VT squared divided by 2 into mu C ox W Y. One interesting fact here you can see is that if C ox increases, means that if you go with more scale technologies, this uh, transconductance increases and uh, W by L, which is called aspect ratio of the device, also helps you to get better and better transconductance. So therefore, it will have also a very good small signal transconductance as we will see. But right now, you can see that it's almost first order approximation says it's independent of EDS and the current is controlled by VGS. Yes, yes. In fact, let's look at this structure. This is the same phenomena that I explained, so it is a visual explanation. See, look at the right side. On the right side, if you increase the rain and you keep gates constant, so the field at the edge of this oxide, tin oxide, will increase. And there is a breakdown limit for the field, for the oxide, SiO2, where if the field crosses that limit, then oxide will break in the other way. Actually, the path for flowing, the, in fact, the structure of SiO2 now will completely collapse. And therefore, path for the current will be provided to flow. And means that the insulator is not an insulator anymore. So that is called gate drain breakdown voltage. We have gate source breakdown voltage. We have drain bulk breakdown voltage because that's also a PN junction. But this voltage, gate drain and gate source breakdown voltage, has the minimum value. In any device, semiconductor device, we have to see that where we have, we are limited, and that limitation is the minimum value, not maximum value of the breakdown. So we are limited mainly because of this tin oxide, not PN junction. PN junction may tolerate higher voltages, but the breakdown here is very low. For example, in 180 nanometer, you cannot apply around 2.5 volt. Device will break. So this oxide thickness is very low, it's around just 4 nanometer. So field will be high, field is huge in this oxide. So that's why this is a problem because when technology, for analog, because when technology scales down, everything scales down. But analog doesn't take advantage of this scaling the way digital does. And therefore we need to keep the scales high. But when we keep the scales high, because the ox has reduced, therefore the effective capacitances increase as technology scales down, which is opposite to digital trend. But, uh, but drive capability improves because after all, the ox has improved. Therefore, with high aspect ratio, one can handle this drawback by get, having a, a specifically when you want to drive high capacitors and these are connected, say, to the output pins. And the chip has to drive those capacitors. So therefore, you are not so limited because of parasitics. You don't mind to increase aspect ratio and go with a larger device. So in that case, because after all, load capacitance is much larger than parasitics. But if load capacitance is low and you want to use a very large device, then the parasitic capacitances of the device themselves become problem, specifically for the another circuit which has to drive this circuit or this device. That's why the scaling always doesn't help. But at IOs, we use pretty large devices. And IOs usually have higher oxide thickness, therefore their breakdown is higher. So this is the same pinch of phenomena, which shows that the channel moves to the right edge of the channel, moves to the left, and uh, goes farther from the drain edge. Did you mention uh, the saturation current? Is due to uh, velocity saturation. Yes. In that pinch of region. So as we continue, uh, as we increase the gate voltage, the saturation current also increases. Yes. Yes. So, in fact, that is saturation current. Yeah. So saturation current increases. But uh, uh, as we say that uh, the saturation current is due to velocity saturation and velocity saturation is constant. No, velocity saturation. I agree with you. Saturated velocity is constant, but charge carrier or carrier density is not constant. Mm -hmm. At that part, see what will happen is that 
you have this you cannot control exact the amount of carriers in that pinch off region but there is a fact when you have a higher vgs there are more carriers which are velocity saturated see suppose you have you are we are looking at that region in that region number of carriers which have saturated velocity they define the current and they, they their density will increase by increasing vgs because you are moving in strong inversion region or the channel region towards the drain. As this distance reduces, the amount of carriers which are injected into the... Because the pinch-off region is not blocked. Otherwise, current will be zero and it won't be blocked. There will be the flow of current, but density is very low, velocity is very high. But this then velocity finally gets saturated. But this density doesn't get saturated, and it actually increases with the gate voltage. That's why current increases. And in fact, this current is pushed by the inverted part. It's just like you know. Assume that there are many people in a, for example, channel. Okay, a tunnel. And one side there are many people. One side there are less number of people, and those which are where you have more density of people, they are pushed. And as they push, the people who are on the front side, they are they will also pushed. So as the density increases towards the end of the channel, you, you will have more number of people who are reaching to the end in a given time. So it's just uh, like a kind of push, because after all, these are all uh, mobile carriers. And that's why that density changes, but velocity may not change. Okay, so till this point, we had just two regions. We have not talked about the third region, which is sub-threshold. We have talked about two regions, and we have considered only level one simple effects. Now we go with the still level one, but at least second order effects. So one of the second order effects is channel length modulation. And that is because the effective channel length is not really drawn length. When you draw the layout, you don't get exactly the same length because there is a depletion region at the vicinity of the edge of the drain. And because of that, the effective length actually is less. And in fact, when you increase the drain voltage, this point even moves farther to the left. So this depletion region, which is not shown here, exactly exists at the edge of the drain region. And because of that, the effective L is not actually drawn L, will be less than that. And because it is less than that, because that region is depleted, that region is not inverted. And because of that, effective L is less, therefore you will get a little higher current. And this itself changes with the drain voltage, means that delta L, which is shown here, this delta L, and this is assumed to be small as compared to L, this delta L itself is a function of the rain source voltage. Because when you increase drain voltage, the width of depletion region in the substrate towards the source, from drain towards the source, at the edge of the drain, between drain and bulk eventually, increases, which also increases at the channel side. And because of that, you will have a reduced channel length. So this reduced channel length is a function of VDS. Therefore, we know that this delta L is not fixed, but it is relatively small. So it is shown in that way. So because delta L by L is assumed to be very small, therefore we can approximate it by 1 upon 1 plus delta L by L. You know that 1 minus x can be approximated by 1 upon 1 plus x, if x is small. So therefore, we just use this approximation. The main reason for this is because we want to bring it to the numerator so that we will get a simple relation for the IDVD characteristics. Otherwise, you can leave it as it is. OK, so therefore, we bring it into the numerator of ID. And therefore, it becomes 1 plus delta L by L. Because L in the numerator, they want us to make it simpler. Now, if you notice, it is same as previous relation. Only we have this term extra over there. And delta L is a function of VDS, and it increases with VDS. That means that in the saturation region, as we increase VDS, delta L increases, therefore means ID increases. Therefore, slope of these lines actually is not zero. 
So, slope of these lines depends on delta L by L which increases by increasing radius. Eventually, slope increases, absolute value also increases. So, both are increasing by increasing VDS. In fact, second order effect tells us even the slope is not fixed. So, for now, we have gone only with, by considering we have a delta L by L and delta L, but the dependency of delta L by VDS is not required. What you will do that, in fact, your first assignment will be based on that, you will learn how from IDVD characteristics extract value of the slope and then use that slope for manual calculations. So, we will go in the opposite way. Because in scale technologies, not, these parameters are not given. We are not going to use level 1 spice for simulation. We use VSIM 3 V3, version 3. And because of that, we have to deal with around 50 parameters. And for that, there is no lambda, what is called, in fact, it's delta L by L as a function of VDS. is modeled by a first order relation lambda VDS, but that is not given in the model file. It is just level 1 old model, but it's good for hand calculations. So here actually we want to uh, get rid of this delta L by L so that we can get this relation with VDS. So here we know that this the variation of current with VDS is a function of VDS, which means that it's a function of current. So uh, how it is modeled here? It says that, see, let's define the first part of this relation, which doesn't have any dependence on VDS as IDD. I just call it IDD so that this will be separated. The first part, which is multiplied by 1. The second part, which is the same multiplied by delta L by L, is separated. Now see, what we have is, this is IDD, okay? And variation of ID with respect to VDS. Because see, we know that this delta L is a function of VDS. It's a function of this part, right? Because this part is a coefficient. Therefore, it appears. Therefore, it's proportional to IDD. It eventually tells you the same thing. The variation of ID with VDS depends on ID, which means depends on VDS. Means that even the slope itself is a function of ID. So therefore, we just, what we do is that we, we use this as a proportion. See, it may be even proportional to IDD squared. Right? So there might be completely nonlinear relation. Here we assume it's a linear relation. That's why we simplify. That is called first order approximation. So we assume it is just proportional to IDD. And therefore, that constant of the proportionality is called lambda. So therefore, we will get eventually what is this delta L by L? This tells us that it is variation of the L with the VDS, variation of L with VDS will lead to variation of ID with respect to VDS. And we model it right over here. Eventually, we have a constant current plus a delta I. And delta I is a function of delta VD. Eventually, we write it in that form, right? So therefore, we consider here in these plots, we have a slope. So it's not a zero slope. It's a slope. Therefore, if you have delta V, you will have delta ID. And delta ID is that slope multiplied by delta VD. And that is actually is the output transconductance. Delta ID upon delta VD is the small signal output transconductance. Okay, so therefore we consider it's, it is proportionality constant as lambda. And therefore now we can write the relation as IDD is same as before. Eventually, we will write delta L by L proportional, that uh, term to be proportional to VDS. That's it, lambda VDS. IDD naturally is the factor. will come out. So we will consider it's just the first order approximation lambda VDS. And this lambda doesn't exist in this same model. It's just the first order approximation we make. What you can do is that if you want to derive it, you need to just derive the slope. And in NG spice, it is possible when you plot a graph, derive the slope of that graph. Whatever y versus x, whatever y and x are, you can derive delta y as a, uh, divided by delta x at every point. So even by simulation, you would be able to figure out whether slope remains almost constant or it changes drastically. 
So if it changes, we will have second order, and the way it changes, we will go to higher orders of the approximation. So that is, in fact, if you go with this relation, that is variation of lambda itself as a function of VDS. If lambda is constant, then we have a pure linear relationship with VDS. No, the reason is because that region is not depleted. When we integrate, see we are integrating here based on the inversion. The right side is inverted region. Now, the inverted region doesn't end at L. Inverted region will end around L dash. So you have a small depleted region around the ring. It's not exactly depleted. It is almost means that even if the device is in triode region, still there is a small depletion region over there, which is not fully inverted. So we cannot consider it as an inverted region. That means we are assuming that the potential at L and L dash both are BDS. Yes. We, that we use that approximation. In fact, we use one more approximation. I didn't mention it. I just wanted to see if everybody say. I told you like VD minus VT, right? At the drain side. But that is uh, VGD should be more than VT so that you will have inverted. But whether this VT is same as VT at the source side. Yeah, what do you think? Whether VT will be same at both sides. If you want to invert the channel, when you apply drain voltage. Yeah, because you have biased the drain. It's like that the body effect. But approximately we consider same VT. So we use many approximations. But that is okay, because after all you will see that. Which even this first order model, considering you extract some of the parameters from simulation. If you do that, you will get a relatively good design and then you will be able only fine tune it. Yeah, so therefore we have all these assumptions to be able to proceed. There are more assumptions, even at the source side also we consider same thing. Otherwise we have to include that effect in phi B also. See, threshold voltage is two phi B. Again, there also the assumption is that the potential remains zero because you have a small depletion region at the source side also. Specifically when you bias the source. But when we wanted to talk about body effect, I didn't mention it because I just mentioned the impact on the depletion region from bulk side, not from source to the channel side. That part I ignored. And that is ignored. First order effect, it is ignored. But if you look at BC model, Equations. BSIM is available. All documents, models are available from Berkeley side. Because BSIM was developed by Berkeley. In Google, you just type BSIM and then Berkeley, you will go to, you will get the first link to the website. And there they have given all equations from all levels of this model, all versions of BSIM. So right now we have BSIM 4, we have BSIM 4 FinFET, but we will follow BSIM 3 version 3, which is good enough for 189. So this is one effect, which is channel length modulation, and it appears as variation of current in saturation region with VD. Therefore, that means it will appear as an output impedance. The second non-ideality that we have is velocity saturation even in the inverted region. The reason is because when device becomes very short channel, it's very short, Therefore, you can see that when device is very short, for a given uh, W, W by L increases a lot, right? This is one thing. Second thing is that when the channel is very short, drift velocity almost reaches to saturation velocity. By the way, saturation velocity here, as I have written, this is based on the values given in the reputed, well-known, like... Uh, Z as well as uh, Streetman. So this box, it's around in the literature it is mentioned. It's around 10 to the power 7 centimeter per second for electrons. For holes, it's less, a little less. So when the channel length reduces, so actually, because see, the velocity of the carrier in this channel increases. But after all, they cannot go beyond velocity, it's the saturation velocity. 
Therefore, that means that even you may have enough careers and then channel is inverted. But still, in spite of that, channel is already inverted. Uh, electrons already have reached to velocity saturation. Even without entering this velocity saturation region, which is saturation region. Then what will happen for the equation? Still now, we didn't consider. What will happen is that the current, you know, this was the total the, the volume of that cuboid, which was V multiplied by W multiplied by uh, Cox into VGS minus. This was volume. Uh, okay, this is per unit length. L is not considered. This is the W into V was, was the uh, area. This is current. That is charge per unit length. I multiplied, V multiplied by, w, by V. We will get char charge per second because Per unit length, we have a charge which is equivalent with W C ox into this voltage term. Multiply by V will tell us the volume of this, uh, the entire cuboid in one second. Multiply by charge density. So we will get the total charge which travel over one second. So this is charge per unit length overall. Multiply by length. Uh, travel by carrier in one second will give us the current. Okay, so now here this V already reaches to saturated velocity. Therefore, from here onwards, we cannot continue with the way we proceeded last time. So, what will happen is that now if we go with this relation and taking uh, integration, instead of this square in the saturation region, we will get this relation which is eventually tells you see it's a very simple relation tells you see total charge is same as before but v has a maximum v which is v sat that means that your current now is limited to this value and this is called id sat this id sat happens even when device may not have saturated but here here the relation i'm showing here is the relation for saturation region in the presence of velocity saturation in the strong inversion so there are two things. One is velocity saturation in the channel where you have carriers, enough carriers, it's strongly inverted, you will get. And then how this have imp will have impact on the current in the saturation region itself, that's the impact. Eventually it tells you, instead of having a square law, you will have a simple linear relationship with the VGS minus VT. That is, of course, the ultimate extreme case. There is a case between these two where approximately you get an exponent which is between 1 and 2. And that is called alpha. And sometimes they call it alpha law instead of square law because alpha is not exactly 2. But then details again are given in the BC model. We don't go beyond this because we don't want to again make it complicated for design. For design, we prefer to have equations which are relatively okay, doesn't give, don't give error, uh, too much error, but at the same time, they predict behavior. And this is to know that we have also velocity saturation, which may happen for the short channel device, even in the strong inversion. See, actually, there was no one by two. Look at this relation here. There is no one by two. One by two actually came when we replaced VGS by VGS minus VT. So therefore, you go. You don't go here. You don't start from here. You start from the main relation. Then there you don't get one by two. Okay. Now one important region, which is not so important in the digital design, but it's very important for low power analog design, is the sub threshold region. In the textbooks, this region is not very much appreciated because because in the you know traditional designs, nobody was so much fun of keeping transistor in sub threshold one of the problem is that device becomes very sensitive to variations because see sub threshold itself depends on vt therefore when vt changes with the process so if you bias the transistor you transistor it may go either to weak inversion very weak inversion or towards cutoff or it may go to moderate towards strong inversion and the equations will change but now because of the low power design, so it has become almost a kind of important region. And many designs in many applications 
have the transistor completely operated in the subthreshold. That's why we spend enough time and then uh, we talk about this region as well. So this region, in this region, um, mechanism of transport is not drift. Therefore, it doesn't behave like a resistor, even if you consider mo simple mobile carriers in the channel. What happens is that instead of drift, you will have diffusion, which is the mechanism, me mechanism available in bipolar transistors. Here, you don't have enough carrier really to see the uh, significant drift. Those drift may also happen. In fact, we have a smooth transition from subthreshold to strong inversion. That region also is called moderate inversion, when you will have almost a combination of both. But let's go to subthreshold when device is not completely on, channel is not completely inverted, but we have a still carriers. And these carriers now will have more density at the source side and less at the towards the drain side. And therefore, you have gradient of the carriers. Because of that, therefore, a diffusion current flows. And that is the subthreshold current. This subthreshold current, because it's a diffusion current, follows the diffusion current the same way you have in bipolar transistors. So therefore, you have an exponential relation between charge and potential. And therefore, current also follows that exponential relation. That's why the current in this region is given by two terms. One term, which is VGS minus VT. VT is the threshold voltage. VGS minus threshold voltage upon NVT. VT is the thermal voltage. So we have two VT. To discriminate them from each other, I show the threshold voltage with TH and thermal voltage with capital T only. So that discriminates them, though when we pronounce both of them are same. So when these two terms are actually uh, VGS minus VT and VGD minus VT. In fact, I write it, uh, see, actually the relation is like that. I don't spend time to derive it, but that's available in uh, textbooks. So eventually it is I0, and you have two terms. One is VGS minus VT, threshold voltage, upon N, thermal voltage, minus VGT minus VT. Okay? So you have this relation. This is the actual relation. Now, here, because uh, we talk about always VGS, VDS, because the standard plots are VGS, VDS. Therefore, VGD is not a term that is commonly used, though it is very important. That defines the boundary of strong inversion, uh, boundary of saturation and triode. In fact, now you know that if VGD is more than threshold voltage for N channel, we will be in ohmic region or triode region. This is not related to subthreshold, I'm just writing it for you. And for N channel, P channel transistor, it will be less than VTHP. It's just, but therefore, VGD is an important parameter, but uh, standard plots are IDVD and IDVG. Therefore, here the trick is that we write VGD. as VGS minus VDS. Always is like that. VGD is VGS minus VDS. And therefore, you will find the term VGS upon NVT come on between two exponential terms. And then you can take factor. When you take factor, then you will reach to the relation I have. So that is just I explained how this The only original relation is of threshold. So there is no square law. So now we take that VGS minus VT out. Okay, I think I have written two VT here. This VT is not required. This VT. It becomes VDS upon VT. In your notes, don't write this VT. I will remove it. When you take the common factor, it's only VGS minus VT upon NVT. You take that E to the power VGS minus VT upon NVT out. 
you will get 1 minus e to the power minus vds upon vt. This is just a mistake. Okay. So, now here, what is the value of i0? That is, that, that's proportional to w by l mu c ox. So, this is same as the proportionality constant you have in saturation region. You have a term which is square, thermal voltage square and n. n is actually, n is, co is coming because of that. that. That is because the potential at the channel, at the channel, actually is like a voltage division because you have two capacitors. One is the depletion capacitor. I think I have it somewhere here. Yes. If you look at these two capacitors, C1 and C2. So C1 is the gate and channel capacitance, which is C ox. But you have also a depletion capacitance from that to the bulk, which is shown from channel to the bulk, which is shown by C2. So whenever you apply a voltage, this voltage eventually becomes, uh, the voltage you get at the channel becomes a voltage division between these two capacitors. And that voltage division determines what voltage you have actually in the channel. That's why this is that inverse of that voltage division, which appears here. It is C ox upon C ox plus C D, and inverse of that, which is N. 1 upon N is that term, and N becomes C ox plus C D upon C ox. Typical value of N is something between 1 and 1.5. So this is N which appears. And here you will get a very interesting behavior. See, look, if I take Ln from both sides and if I assume Vds is large enough so that Vds upon Vt, e to the power minus Vds upon Nvt is almost zero, I will get a simple relation of I0 e to the power Vgs minus Vt upon eta Vt. So if I take Ln from both sides, so I0 is a constant value, therefore I show it as a constant term on the right side, you will see that we have an interesting relation here. Ln of Id, Ln of Id is actually proportional to Vgs minus Vt and of course a constant we have on the other side. But that means that if you plot, for example, if you look at Id Vg characteristics, Id as a function of Vg, it's an exponential plot. If you plot it in logarithmic scale, in y-axis logarithmic, it will appear at a line. And you may have noticed Subthreshold region usually shown is shown by a line when you look at IDVG characteristics. That is because this relation is logarithm, uh, exponential and therefore when we take LN, it becomes a uh, linear relation as a function of VGS minus VT plus some constant. So there is a very important parameter which is used by digital community and they call it subthreshold swing. I just thought it's better to define it here also because you may see it somewhere you may want to know what is that. That is, when you change the gate voltage corresponding to 10 times change in the drain current, how much you will have change in the gate voltage. Therefore, suppose you have ID at, in sub-threshold. You want to increase ID by a factor of 10, means 10 times more because this is exponential. Now you can talk about 10 times more. So therefore, if ID increases by 10 ID to 10 ID, therefore the amount of increase on the left side will be Vt ln 10, right? Of course, N Vt ln 10. That amount is the amount of delta Vgs on the right side. And that is called subthreshold swing. And do you know what is the typical value of that? 60 millivolt. Do you know how it comes? It's just you calculate. Consider n is 1, that is the best, right? Lower is better because if it is lower, it means that with a little change in VGS, current increases by 10. That is, that's why the swing is very low. You have a sharp transition from off to on region. If the slope is low, therefore the swing is higher. You need higher VGS to increase the current from 0 to high value when it goes from substitution to strong inversion. See, it is, if you take N equal to 1, Vt is 25 millivolt, and Ln 10 is around 2.3. So 2.3 into 25, 
will give you around 60 right so that's why this is the practical value of the subthreshold swing and that's why the bulk devices have limitation of providing a very steep transition so but this this anyway now but anyway we use this region though it is not a very large region so it depends on the value of threshold but suppose if threshold what they say is around 400 millivolt for n channel which is a typical value in 180 nanometer if you go below gate overdrive of minus 100 millivolt gate overdrive 100 millivolt minus 100 means that vgs is 300 millivolt or less we can say that we have entered into sub threshold see we don't have any abrupt transition from sub threshold to strong inversion there is a region where you have almost mixture of these two and that is called moderate inversion so how much is the typical range for that that depends on the device but you can consider this as a so therefore if VGS is less than VT. I use letter N so that it shows it is N channel. So how much smaller than VTN is sub threshold? You can say that around by around 100 millivolt. Therefore, means that VGS less than equal VTHN minus 100 millivolt. This is just approximation. It's not exact, but suppose 8, 80 millivolt below VT. Similarly, above that also. It's not like that as soon as you have VT, VT plus 1 millivolt will give you a strong inversion. So again, there also you have a transition region. There also you can consider around. So therefore, we have the moderate inversion. This is for sub-threshold. Sub-threshold is also called weak inversion. So for moderate inversion, you can consider the GS is something around VTHN minus 100 millivolt and VTHN plus 100. Same thing is valid about P channel. This 100 might be a little less or more, but the best thing is always by, by simulation. Because this is not something by hand calculation or modeling by level one we are able to predict only by plotting idvg in logarithmic scale you would be able to see exact re that region of transition from simulation see right now we are talking about the case say let's consider vds is large enough okay so we have cons in fact we consider to go with this relation and get the sub threshold swing. We consider VDS is large enough, much larger than VT. So therefore, there is no question of triode region for now. Okay, but the question is that whether channel is inverted or not. Do we have enough carriers or not to reach to the saturation current? The answer is no. If VGS is below VT, we don't have carriers, enough carriers, but device is not off as well. Because after all, channel is depleted. Right? So, therefore, we have crossed that flat band condition. When, see, in flat band condition, there was no carrier. But now we have crossed that. We are not saying that VGS is equal to, in fact, flat band was around minus 700 millivolt. Means that if you have a VGS equal to zero, also you will have a current. That's very important. That means that even at VGS equal to zero for a given VGS, you have some charge. And therefore, current will flow. But that current, that density is not enough to make drift current a dominant drift mechanism and me, dominant mechanism of transport and therefore it will follow it become only a function of gradient of the carriers we have this gradient even when device is in saturation region and strong inversion but at that time drift is the dominant component of the current drift current Yes, and that is what is actually is the cause of leakage in the digital applications. In analog, we use it as an information. Therefore, the leakage current in digital actually is the source of information in analog, in very low power application. 
all the ray device goes from high current to low current but is still in the subthreshold. Therefore, the entire current and this relation matters for us. And it's not just that the current, right? So, see, for digital applications, you want to reduce this swing. For analog applications, you may not want. You may actually uh, like to have a wider range of the subthreshold. You will get more headroom. Very low power, right? Uh, you were here. Uh, there was a, I don't know, you were here a, a couple of weeks ago, a talk by some people from industry. So they talked about a, a full system in nanowatt power. That can happen only if all transistors are in subtraction. An analog mix signal system, not a digital system. Another question? So it will be very interesting because then effectively you will end up in the same concepts of bipolar design because now you are dealing with the exponential relations. We finish the subthreshold. So we just give a summary. So it is eventually very low frequency large signal behavior. Low frequency large signal is same as DC almost, right? So the, the reason is because we didn't include any capacitive effect. We assume all capacitors are almost open. Therefore, effectively, it's like a DC behavior. So we have uh, transistor behaving as a resistor, that is deep triode region or triode region. And then we have a voltage control current source behavior, which is in the saturation region. And uh, we have also similar behavior as a voltage control current source in subthreshold. And the difference was both of them are current source. And we can use both of them, but in one of them, the behavior with respect to control voltage, which is VGS minus VT, is exponential. In the other case, is square law or alpha law, depending on the saturation velocity. And it's very important, all these regions are controlled by that important parameter of gate over dry voltage. Therefore, in the design also, when we want to decide about the operating region, we decide and choose how much overdrive we want to consider for the transistors. How much will be the minimum overdrive? How much will be maximum overdrive when signal is applied and transistor moves across different regions? Then we can now start a small signal model, which is very important in analog. Okay.